going to be the last time that I have to address you all as a group uh, during this event. So I, I really do want to thank you so much for coming to our 30th anniversary. Um, so many of you said so many kind things to me. It, it really warms my heart. Thank you so much. Um, it's been such a pleasure to see old friends, new friends. I hope you've made friends. Uh, it's been just a great weekend for us all. So thank you so much. And thank you. So as promised last night and throughout the last few days, um, we have a, a drawing and uh, someone's going to win um, a free symposium for next year. And I, I have the pleasure of saying that Khan uh, Herb Company, they're so generous. They're actually contributing uh, $350 to someone's uh, pass for next year as well. So they're basically almost like two free symposiums. So that's really nice. Um, is Khan, anybody from Khan here? No. So you know where the booth is. Go say hi and thank you. So let's see who, hopefully it's somebody here. You didn't have to be present for this one. Let's see. So this is the one for Khan. We'll do that one first. And the name is Gail McGuire. Is Gail here? No? Okay, well, that's good. So we'll track her down and give her the good news. So that's the Khan winner. And then for the Pacific, Symp Pacific Symposium, going deep and it's all random. So next year, we hope we see Kathleen M. Campbell here. At, n at no cost. Kathleen, fantastic. All right. <laughs> Kathleen, where are you from? From Santa Fe. All right, well, fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for coming this year. All right. All right, so <laughs> almost everybody's a winner here. Um, so our last general session speaker of 2018 has worked in the field of health education and complementary medicine for over 45 years as a practitioner, teacher, author, and entrepreneur. In 1971, wow, yes, that's way back. That's when I graduated from high school. <laughs> he co-founded Infinity Foods, a natural and organic food shop in Brighton, England, and subsequently co-founded the Brighton Natural Health Center. He became an acupuncturist in 1978. He taught Chinese medicine, health maintenance, and Qigong internationally, and is the founder and publisher of the Journal of Chinese Medicine, which I hope you all get. He's the co-author of the very well-known A Manual of Acupuncture, and the author of Live Well and Live Long, Teachings from Chinese Nourishment of Life, of Life Tradition. He first presented at Pacific Symposium in 2004. Please welcome Peter Dedman. A couple of years ago, I published this book that Jack mentioned, Live Well, Live Long. It's perhaps not surprising that as I got older, I got more interested in figuring out how to prolong life, um, especially as I am of the belief that you only get one shot at life, there's no uh, second round. But actually, um, my interest in the tradition of health maintenance goes back to the very beginning of my career, uh, as Jack mentioned. By the way, look, no slides, just me. <laughs> okay, um, you've probably been looking at screens enough, so hopefully I can hold your attention just myself. So as Jack mentioned, in 1971, I co-founded a, a natural and macrobiotic food shop. The inspiration for this was my own health. I traveled a lot in my late teens and early 20s. I lived a wild and reckless life. I had a lot of fun, but I got sick. I had a very bad case of hepatitis. I was stranded in a tiny Moroccan village feeling that I was on my deathbed, probably probably just man flu really, but anyway, and uh, feeling rather desperate. And I came across this book, it was called uh, Zen Macrobiotics by a Japanese called George Osawa. And what this book promised or suggested is that by 
changing the way we eat, eating a natural food diet based on whole grains, lots of vegetables, pulses, seaweeds, nuts and seeds, zero sugar and very little dairy foods and little animal food, that we could um, transform our health, that's what I wanted, and we could also protect against future disease. And at the time, this was extremely radical. You have to understand in the early 1970s, as far as the medical profession was concerned, food, diet had a negligible um, effect on health. In fact, pretty much the only thing they associated with diet was uh, frank deficiency diseases, vitamin B deficiency, vitamin C deficiency. Otherwise, food was largely irrelevant, how things have changed. And so the inspiration for this food shop we set up was to make the story available to the community we lived in, to offer what were then largely unavailable simple natural foods at affordable prices. And a few years after we set that up, we opened a thing called the Brighton Natural Health Centre to expand the range of things that we were offering to help people take charge of their own health. We're teaching yoga. So now in my city, probably like here, you can't throw a stone without hitting a yoga centre. Um, there, it didn't exist. Nobody was doing yoga. Hardly anybody was doing Tai Chi. We taught meditation, we taught natural food cooking, all as part of this project to offer tools for maintaining and improving health. Um, then I started studying Chinese medicine, so my ears were very alert to that part of Chinese medicine which talked about um, prevention and talked about adaptation of lifestyle um, in relation to disease. I then had the very good fortune, as I'm sure some people here did, to study with Dr. John H. F. Shen in the 1980s. Did anybody else here study with him? Okay, so you may not know him. Dr. Shen uh, finished his life practicing in New York, although he spent the bulk of his career in Taiwan. He was really one of the most extraordinary doctors I've ever met, and I think anybody who studied with him would say that, with the most um, uncanny diagnostic skills. But his diagnosis and the thing that he kept repeating and kept impacting on me was, it's not enough when you practice medicine to identify the problem, or rather identify the disharmony or the pattern or whatever approach you use, and then move on to treatment. That's not enough. The question he asked about every patient is why? Why, why, why? Why is this person ill? What is the source of this person's problem? So, because self-evidently, if it's an ongoing cause, you're unlikely to be able to help them and certainly uh, help them a lot if, if that cause is not addressed. If somebody has a chronic digestive disorder because their eating is chaotic, it doesn't matter how, what herbal prescriptions you use or what acupuncture you use, you won't get rid of the problem. Their lifestyle is overcoming the treatment and that applies very widely. In the UK, we have um, a national health service. We're very proud of it. Most British people love it. It offers treatment free at the point of delivery, paid, paid through by taxes. Um, it's not perfect, but we do, some of us wonder whether it's named correctly. It's called the National Health Service and perhaps it should more accurately be called the National Disease Service. Um, we spend an average of over, a bit over $2,000 per person on treatment and about 60, that's per year, and about $60 on um, health prevention or disease prevention and health education. And so my question, one of my questions, what, just say what I'm going to do in this short talk 
is try, it's difficult in a very limited time, to give a kind of brief bird's eye view of Yang showing the nourishment of life. Um, of course, we need good technicians. We need brilliant acupuncturists, we need brilliant herbalists, doctors, surgeons. We all need help. At some point in our lives, we need to turn to other human beings to be helped by them. But Chinese is full of pithy sayings, and one of them is medicine can only cure curable diseases, and then not always. So whatever our uh, dreams and expectations as acupuncture students, once we get into the cold face of practice, we discover that um, for many disorders, we're not going to be able to cure them. If somebody has chronic cardiovascular disease or chronic diabetes or has dementia uh, or has advanced cancer and so on, we're not going to be able to cure them. We might be able to help them, we might be able to maintain them, but not cure. Um, so this idea, if we look back to the Yellow Emperor's classic, the Neijing, I think it's probably true to say that most books, most non-fiction books, lay out their stall, say what they're about in the first few pages of the book. So if you remember, um, page one, chapter one, page one, opening of the Neijing, is a discussion between the Yellow Emperor and Qi Bo, his um, advisor. And the Yellow Emperor asks famously, how come nowadays, and this is over 2000, around 2000 years ago, how come in the past people lived to the age of 100 and were strong and fit and healthy, and nowadays they're decrepit at the age of 50. And Chi Bo says it's their lifestyle. They don't have any order in their rising and sleeping. They drink alcohol like water. They don't manage their emotions. They're victims of chaotic, a chaotic emotional life, and so on and so forth. How modern that is. And then in chapter two, also very famously, it speaks of the sages. We assume they were the wise doctors of old who did not treat people once disease had arisen, but intervened before disease occurred. Treating after disease has arisen, it says, is like only starting to dig a well when you're already thirsty or dying of thirst. We're only starting to forge weapons once the battle is raging all around you. So what's the situation today? If you sit in any um, national health ministry with a, de with a, uh, a report, st st statistical report about um, chronic non-infectious disease, you're going to be terrified. We're suffering, the world is suffering from an epidemic of non-infectious diseases. Cancer, diabetes, um, obesity, depression, strokes, cardiovascular disease, and so on. And the bad news is that the incidence of these diseases is rising everywhere in the world. So. Uh, not just in the developing world, what's happening, what's been happening in the developing world is as Western lifestyles, which I would say is predominantly Western diet, modern Western diet, secondarily lack of exercise and various new kinds of stress, wherever that spreads, these chronic diseases rise and are beginning and will present an unbearable economic burden. But um, it's the same here. Uh, take cardiovascular disease, for example, it's the biggest killer worldwide. Um, by 2030, that's pretty close. It's expected that 40% of the US population will suffer from cardiovascular disease, with a, an estimated rise in costs from currently around $250 billion a year to over $800 billion. 
dementia, 44 million people now with suffering from dementia expected to rise triple to triple by 2050. The US cost um, in 2050 expected to be up to $2,000 billion. Now, these are simply unaffordable by any health system in the world. There is no way that we can treat our way out of this chronic epidemic of lifestyle diseases. So, what can we do about it, is the question. I believe in what I'm arguing today, and not so much in my book, because that's addressed to the general population, but here is that Chinese medicine practitioners can play a really vital role in health education, particularly by drawing on the rich resources of the young Sheng nourishment of life tradition. We are the, just the same as we're in awe of the wisdom we inherit about um, acupuncture and about herbs, we should be equally or even more in awe of the tradition we inherit about the nearly two and a half thousand year old tradition of knowing how to look after this human thing, yeah? this body-mind. But I don't know how it is in Chinese medicine education now. I suspect it hasn't changed that much. I would say when I studied, studied, it was kind of referred to in passing or it may crop up when you talk about the spleen, you might talk about diet a bit, but I doubt if it was um, really a core part of the curriculum, uh, especially because as I tried to indicate by referring to the Neijing, the Yellow Emperor's classic, I would say this is not just a branch of Chinese medicine like acupuncture or like herbal medicine or like Twina. This is the foundation. This is the root of what Chinese medicine is really about. Health, of course, treating disease, but at its root, promoting health. Um, I think I tried to sort of analyze levels of practice in Chinese medicine. Um, some of them apply to all medicine, from superficial to deep. So the most superficial, I think we all generally agree is, uh, although very useful sometimes, treating empirically, treating locally. Yeah? Some of the things that Witt was talking about are empirical and local treatments, and they're brilliant, they have their place. And then if we go deeper, we can say that we, we start to use differentiation and, and I don't like to use the word shallow maybe again, but maybe something like that. The first level of differentiation that people use a lot is channel differentiation. What is the disease channel? There are all these systems out there of treating of channel based diagnosis and treatment through palpation. Uh, Dr. Tan, Tong acupuncture, meridian wave acupuncture, there's loads, I don't know them all. Huh? So that's the kind of the first level of differentiation. But I would say deeper than that is differentiation of patterns according to the Dong Fu, to Qi and blood and body fluids and so on. And why is that deeper? Well, because first of all, it's invaluable in treatment it points forwards to the treatment. If you have your indeficiency, you diagnose the pattern of your indeficiency, you know some part of your treatment will be to nourish in. But just as importantly, it points backwards to possible causation. A patient with uh, indeficiency will have different causes of disease than a patient who has liver cheese stagnation. And therefore the adaptations they might need to make in their behavior and lifestyle are going to be different. Yeah. Somebody has phlegm and dampness, you may focus a lot on diet, for example. Somebody has liver cheese stagnation, don't mention diet because they probably bring a kind of obsessive compulsive <laughs> attitude to diet like they do to many other things. You know, first of all, liver cheese stagnation 
is to exercise more and is to express themselves more. So um, pattern differentiation already points towards causation and recognizing um, causes of disease leads on to trying to rectify the cause of disease, which leads on to trying to prevent disease in the first place, individually, in individuals, in communities, in uh, global populations. I say global populations, it's probably true to say that the um, arrival of clean water in our cities probably did more for human health than all of medicine ever put together. So I'm, I'm suggesting we don't just think small, we think big as well. And the biggest level of thinking now that I would say as people engaged in the healing professions we're all called upon to do everything we can do about is the health of the planet, which is in crisis and needs healing. The health of the planet. No? Can you all hear me? Okay. So again, big view. So if we take, you might think, a rather idealistic view, I will, I'm offering it for you to think about, a, a view of what might be the doctor's role, the sage, you know, Neijing talks about sages. What would be the sage doctor's role? Well, first of all, um, in relation to patients, modeling, modeling healthy behavior. Gandhi was once asked by a woman, she brought her son to him and said, Mahatma, please tell my son to stop eating so much sugar. He seems to be addicted to it. And Gandhi said, yeah, okay, come back in a week. She was a bit puzzled, but she came back in a week and Gandhi said, young man, you must stop eating so much sugar. Those are the days where people obeyed their elders, you know. Um, and the mother said, thank you, why did I have to come back? And we, and he said, well, I had to stop eating sugar first. <laughs> so we need to be models. Uh, we need to model good health. You can't realistically ask your patients to be changing their lifestyle in ways that we're not changing. This is the opposite of the cigarette addicted, alcohol addicted, semi-suicidal general practitioner we sometimes hear about. Okay. And this afternoon, actually, I'm going to be talking about um, cultivating the mind and emotions. And one thing that I'll be talking about, and actually we'll, we'll practice, we'll do some, some um, practical work, is, is understanding how it really ties in with what Ted was saying, how the emotional centeredness and presence and in scientific terms, parasympathetic dominance that the practitioner is in, transmits powerfully to patients as part of the healing process. So what Ted was talking about, healing starts before herbs are drunk, before needles are given. We, I, I'd love to talk about it more, but that's the subject for this afternoon, that we can, um, assist people who are stuck in chronic sympathetic dominance. We can assist them to move into parasympathetic. I, th I imagine you sort of understand what I mean by that. If not, come this afternoon. So we model healthy behavior. We inform patients about health and lifestyle rather than advising them advice. Giving advice is often unhelpful. It, calls forth a rather childish response in people along the lines of, yes, doctor, and inside a voice is going, won't. Um, so just simply giving really tailored, accurate, informed information through our understanding of that person, that person's life, that person's pattern, and that person's need. So we need to be able to develop the skill to see what needs to change in a person and to support them and encourage them in that change. I do need to say um, in passing, although it's a big subject, that um, we need to remember actually that there are th three principal factors that contribute to 
whether we live a life that is innately healthy or is has a lot of ill health and challenge and difficulty. And the first, of course, is constitution. We're all born with different constitutions. Um, we know that if you live born to long-lived parents, you're much more likely to live long yourself. If you're born to short-lived parents, you're much more likely to live short yourself. And there are many kinds of disease we can um, develop for genetic and constitutional reasons. That's pre-heaven gene. Also remember that pre-heaven gene doesn't just come from the mating of the parents, it can also be significantly affected by uterine life. So we know, as Sun Samiao suggested very clearly, that if a woman suffers uh, trauma and emotional stress in the first and second trimester, a baby is much more likely to face um, mental, uh, developmental and physical health challenges even through their whole life. This is what's called Tai Jiao, fetal education. So again, um, this is something we need to know, something we need to do our best to help patients with and if we want to engage on a bigger scale, we want to support a political and economic system that supports women in pregnancy and supports family lifestyles. Um, so that's pre heaven Jing, but the good news, <laughs> the good news is pre heaven Jing is only one kind of Jing. There's another kind, which is post heaven Jing. So post heaven Jing, where does that come from? Well, we absorb it once we're born. First thing we do is breathe. Second thing we do is suckle. We absorb post heaven Jing from food, from air, uh, from nourishment, in other ways, from love, from nature, um, and so on. And if our organs are healthy, if the Zhang Fu are strong and healthy, we're good transformers of this nourishment we receive from our environment. We're good transformers of that into qi. And then if we don't dissipate, we don't waste, we don't exhaust ourselves, we don't um, allow ourselves to be the victim of chaotic emotional life, and so on, then the story is, the Chinese story is that qi is transformed into post heaven jing. Particularly when we sleep, when we meditate, when we slow deep breathe, when we do internal practices. So when we're very quiet, that's when we can build up postnatal jing. So this is the explanation of why even if we have a, um, even if we're challenged by a less than powerful constitution, we can transform our health and we can live longer and live well into old age. So the other factor that must be emphasized too is luck. Um, constitution is luck. We didn't decide unless you believe in karma, we didn't decide um, who we were going to be born to, but luck operates in many other ways. I mean, if a child is born to, into a poor family, it's likely to be of lower birth weight and simply because of that is likely to live shorter and to have a higher risk of chronic disease, uh, mental and physical disease. And that's passed on generation after generation because the child born um, for low, with low birth weight, a girl who then goes on to have babies, her baby is likely to be born uh, with a low birth weight too. So social conditions make an enormous difference. Yeah? There's, a, there's a saying in London that, I don't know who's been to London, but we have a, what we call an underground or a metro, that every stop on the metro or the underground from um, Kensington and Chelsea, the richest <clears throat> part of London, every stop, you lose a year of life expectancy until you get to about 11 or 12 stops. No? That's simply social conditions in poverty. And of course, there's many other things as well, environment. <laughs>